Hello and welcome to Module 11 for Philosophy and Humor. And this week we're going to take a look at the second half of Humor and Postmodernism, which is a pretty heavy topic to begin with. Uh, the best thing to do is to go back and look at what we originally sort of discussed and thought about last week. And that humor, first of all, is a feature of postmodernism, a uh, very significant feature, uh, because it does seem to convey the same sort of characteristics that postmodernism itself has, which is a sense of playfulness, uh, a degree of self-consciousness. Uh, it self-references itself constantly. It could be very ironic. Uh, it mixes high and low culture together. And uh, really, it never takes itself very seriously. There's, there's a kind of like, anything goes, let's just play, right? Um, you know, we're just dancing on the edge of the world, but we're still dancing, don't worry. So that's a kind of postmodern view. So postmodernism rejects certainty, truth, final answers, uh, just like the kind of uh, the kind of ideas that we saw la or two weeks ago in our comparison between humor and religion, right? Here, postmodernism and and humor kind of tie together really well. Uh, there seems to be uh, more in common between these two fields. So in terms of philosophical thought, which is what uh, kind of what we looked at on the first half of the slides, uh, those are those are kind of heavy, right? So postmodernism, as much as it's playful, self-conscious, ironic, and so on, it's also uh, very aware that we are living in a very image-dominated culture. Social media is basically it has taken over as the principal means of communication between individuals. And that's pretty serious because it changes the way that we, we communicate with one another. Uh, we would rather leave a text than speak to, one, to someone directly. We would rather, you know, speak to someone through a device rather than face to face. Part of it is that when we use a device, we can stop and think about what we're saying first before we blurt it out. Uh, sometimes we get into trouble for doing that. So those kinds of things may be generally speaking, useful, but we still live in a very image-dominated world. Uh, we're drowning in advertisements. We're drowning in visual information. And along with that, we are very skeptic of, uh, or skeptical of people that present to us these kind of meta-narratives, or you know, these grand um, unfoldings of history, history moving in a certain way. We were there, we're going to go here, Anything that's meta-narrative, meta we tend to uh, to be very skeptical about it because, because we don't believe in certainty and truth anymore. Everything is provisional, relative, conditional. That's a postmodern world. And so as a result, we're exhausted, right? We're, we're generally exhausted. We seem to revel in that exhaustion. Uh, we seem to revel in absurdity, um, whether we enjoy watching Adult Swim, whether it's uh, Rick and Morty, or we're looking, we're watching uh, uh, Reggie Watts or Tim Heidegger. Uh, any of that kind of that humor sort of plays with that cultural exhaustion that we're feeling because the the sort of exhaustion is coming from trying to come up with something new. And it's very difficult. We, we can't do it because there really isn't anything new to say. So if that's the case, uh, humor can turn around and short circuit this, uh, you know, the, this cultural exhaustion. And it short circuits, first of all, uh, that dominant culture's repressive impulsive. Um, what that means is the dominant culture, which is, uh, in North America and pretty well around the world, it's, uh, based on capitalism. It's based on hard work. It's based on, uh, whatever free time we have, we should be spending it buying stuff or we should be going out and doing things. So anything that bucks the trend, anything that pushes back against that impulse to buy, that impulse to consume, um, that's a good thing. And often one of the most effective ways to do it is to do it through humor, to push back using humor, because we laugh and we recognize at the same time. Uh, secondly, we can emotionally detach from these, uh, you know, these more practical aspects of life. And as we'll see in some of the clips for, for uh, this week, especially the ones by George Carlin, there is that kind of anthropological, philosophical detachment from everyday things that we do. Uh, and we step back and we look at them and we, we kind of judge them for what they really are, which really, when you boil it down, uh, rather, rather ridiculous. So, that's where postmodernism, on the one hand, pushes onto us 
but we are allowed now to push back because there is no central authority figure that reigns supreme because anyone that's considered an authority figure, we, we try to knock them down. Now, that's not to say that that works successfully every time. Uh, if you look historically, the difference between the 1970s and the 1980s is very similar to what we what happened to us between say the 1990s and the 2000s we ended up having you know elections of right-wing governments that tried to push back as hard as they could against this notion that there isn't an authority figure that there isn't the truth the problem was that it was aligned with such a, a warped and skewed vision of the world that we recognized it for what it was these were not authority figures that were somehow superheroes these were people that if things were allowed to continue at the rate they were going, they would have been out of power, right? They would have been losing much more than they were gaining. So let's not kid ourselves. This is not always a, you know, a fun time. There is pushback quite often, but if we are humorous, we can, we can use that emotional detachment to make sense of what's going on. We have that conceptual flexibility and those perspectives that we can take in order to understand things, that proverbial what if, right? You know, what if this were happening? What's what's up with the following, right? The, the Jerry Seinfeld thing. So for the most part, the relationship between postmodernism and humor is a very positive one because they do reflect this kind of constructive, subversive, negative view of things. But in so doing, it can still be constructive. If what comedians are laughing at or allow, asking us to laugh at is bad, then clearly in recognizing something is bad, that will change our attitudes. That will change our, you know, our worldview of things. So that's not a bad thing. To make fun of something is not necessarily a bad thing. We're not, we're not being nihilistic. We're not walking away from moral values. We're in a sense trying to reaffirm them, but in a, di in a different way. We're doing them in, not in trying to uh, present that, you know, we are the authority figures. We're pointing out something and asking, you know, doesn't, it, doesn't this look kind of weird, you know, kind of, kind of stupid? Yeah, that's kind of the way it works. So there are some individuals that believe that postmodernism is not the entirely fun thing that I've just finished describing. Terry Eagleton, for example, he looks at it as a kind of intellectual dead end. Um, you know, the fact that we can critique all positions, that there is no authority. Uh, truth with a capital T, uh, T, for example, these, these kinds of things are not, you know, these are not good ideas for Eagleton because he says, look, uh, postmodernism, if we really think about it seriously, it does two things very poorly and sets us down the wrong road. One is if we resist these ma master narratives, right, that kind of try to tie things together in a very masterful sort of way, in a kind of grand sort of way, um, we're actually at odds with the Enlightenment movement that's been around since, depending on where you're looking, if it's science or philosophy, either the late 1600s or the beginning of the 1700s, more or less. So at least 300 years, we have been, generally speaking, moving in the right direction. And the master narrative has helped us to move in that, continue to move in that direction. So should we jettison that and get rid of it altogether? Eagleton says, eh, not so fast. And two, if we fav favor relativism, you know, that anything goes, everybody's truth is, or truth is valid. Um, we now dispense with truth altogether because there isn't one overriding truth that is correct with a capital T. And it's all about context, perspective. Now, right in this particular context, in terms of humor, that shouldn't be important. But in more serious matters, such as politics, that does become uh, something far more serious because if anything goes, then whoever wins can take a country in any direction they wish. That could be dangerous. Okay, so that, that was a quick overview of the slides for last week. And so this week, we're going to kind of break it down where it's sort of all over the place. But really what informs all of these ideas are uh, renewed uh, or, or new perspectives on old ideas. And the first one I want to look at is spirituality. Now, postmodern uh, fiction or comic fiction uh, has found really interesting ways to talk about religious themes that aren't 
presented in the way that they used to be, where it was clearly identifiable that the, these are spiritual matters. Uh, what happens in this postmodern comic fiction, and this will be literally anything after the Second World War, so generally since the 1950s, where religious themes up to that point tended to be marginalized because we had a real push by science and philosophy and reason to push aside spiritual matters because they were, first of all, either difficult to prove or they seemed to be irrational. Well, you can't tell somebody that what they believe in is wrong because eventually, guess what? They'll be pushed back there as well. So whether whatever the faith is that you follow, now you can find different avenues to express it. And fiction writers like uh, Thomas Pynchon uh, have been able to challenge, right, this, this primacy or the authority, right, the authority of philosophy and science to turn around and allow other ideas that are maybe considered religious to seep back into this new way of thinking about the world. So what's happening is now the worldview is now including religion. It isn't now frowned upon. Spiritual matters are what they are. So fiction writers like Pynchon, you know, challenge the primacy, the importance, the all, you know, sort of capital T truth of reason and says, look, let's create a space where we can think about religious matters without being either shunned or laughed at or disparaged in some way. Let's weave it in more carefully into the everyday. And so what happens with postmodern comic fiction is that we have these narratives that could be considered spiritual, but they're done in a way that weave in other secular ideas that could be satirical. Uh, both of them could be working together. And what happens is you have this kind of cosmic worldview, right? This cosmic irreverence. And really what's happening with Pynchon's work is we now get to decide for the first time what matters. Now, whether you want to call it moral or religious, it's up to you. But what happens is the things that matter become what is questioned, right? Do you truly believe in life? Do you truly believe in love? And these kinds of things, you know, life and love we need in our everyday world. But what's happened is they've been kind of uh, conditioned or we've been conditioned to look at them in a certain way. And what Pynchon and other uh, sort of postmodern comic fiction writers are doing is they're bringing in these larger questions. But even in a way that may appear satirical, we're still asked to consider them seriously. And that's where we start we start seeing things in a very different way. And this, this way of seeing the world differently is called unworlding. And it is a way in which we can look at these two ideas. Now, remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the holy fool, right? Uh, asking us to consider that meta world, right? That meta reality beyond that reality. What is What unworlding does is something very similar. The writer that uses that device now makes it very difficult for us as we read their work to distinguish between the, the natural and the supernatural world. These two worlds coexist, not next to each other, on top of each other, but within each other. They interpenetrate one another. And so what is considered secular or sacred is not so clear anymore, right? The boundaries are blurred, and that's what makes them postmodern. The boundaries are blurred between the natural and the supernatural world, so that the reading experience is a quite a different one. And so when we are unworlding, what we're doing is we're intertwining, we're bringing these worlds together. And of course, this is quite different from what is typically called worlding, where you you create a world. Um, here's a good example. There's a, a new film coming out, uh, I think by this summer, uh, Dune, which is based on a series of books by Frank Herbert. Uh, Frank Herbert was a uh, science fiction writer, I believe, writing in the 50s, question mark. I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, point is, he was writing to create these utterly unique worlds, right? These, these worlds that take place on other planets. So worlding is often done in science fiction, but it can be done in really any kind of world or any kind of, sorry, fiction. Uh, a world is created. It could be the world of film noir, you know, where people are uh, not who they seem and everything is all covered in shadows. You're not quite sure who, you know, what's going on. Uh, or science fiction, where a brand new world is completely created. Now, that's worlding. 
unworlding is taking the, sac the sacred and the secular and intertwining it together so that we can't even tell one from the other. Now, that's that's pretty heavy stuff. Now, uh, the clip I want you to look at, and it's very short. It's Thomas Pynchon, the very reclusive American fiction writer, appearing on The Simpsons. Okay, there's your high and low culture. I've just finished describing the kind of amazing unworlding that Thomas Pynchon's uh, writing can create, this uh, interpenetrating of the secular and the sacred world. Pynchon is a very well-respected, you know, American writer. And here he is appearing on The Simpsons. Now, how many people watching The Simpsons would even know who Thomas Pynchon is? Who knows? But the point is, he appears there. And what he does and what he says is absolutely correct. Because, first of all, you see him wearing a bag on his head. Very few images have ever been seen of Thomas Pynchon since, I think, maybe either his high school days or maybe when he joined the Army. That's a picture you saw a few slides back. And that's it. So no one really knows what he looks like. We know he continues working. And really, he says, look, who I am doesn't matter. What matters is my writing. So a very short clip. Thomas Pynchon, a respected American writer, appearing on The Simpsons. So have a look at that, uh, at that and come back in just a few moments. Okay, so postmodern fiction writers, comic fi uh, or otherwise, uh, use humor to explore ideas that could be considered philosophical, right? And these are the kinds of ideas that would have been set aside in this sort of enlightenment, rational world that, of course, we've been living in, um, for better or worse, of course. But humor, the, the vehicle of humor allows these sometimes spiritual ideas to come into everyday thoughts, into mainstream thoughts, mainstream fiction. And the end result is, again, this, this, uh, you know, this otherworldliness of these two, uh, I, I guess, two worldviews coexisting. And the way in which they're glued together is through humor and satire. So they may be viewed satirically, but when we're done the text, we're thinking seriously. So satire is usually making fun of something that it's, it itself considers to be important. And that's where satire and religious thought and humor kind of really play well together. Because when you satirize something, you're implying to the reader or thinker that you otherwise consider this important. I'm going to make fun of this president because he's such a freaking buffoon because I personally think that the presidency is an important thing. Why would this orange clown slash, you know, failed reality star end up being president for four years? It's disgusting. So you satirize him. But what you're really also saying when you satirize something is this this role in North American society, well, American society for sure, is an important one. Not just any clown can do it. So you're satirizing someone like Trump, but you're also stating a, a more important truth. So here we have satire, humor, and religion coexisting, or at least spiritual matters. And this is really an interesting way to reintroduce ideas that have not been sort of looked at uh, very much in the, in the past. Now, uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, who says he is a Christian, but I don't see his Christian ideas coming through loud and clear. It just informs his worldview. Uh, this is a clip uh, or a, uh, a bit that he's done in the past, maybe not so much because he's not a chance to work in a theater because of the pandemic. But this is something from about a year and a half ago called God isn't stressing about, about nuclear war. So here is a good example of the natural and the supernatural world coexisting. So Stephen Colbert is unworlding here, right? He's intertwining these two worlds in a very natural kind of way. God appears. Stephen isn't freaked out. He just has a conversation with him. So have a look at this clip, a couple minutes long, and then uh, see you back in just a moment. So we talked first of all, first of all, about spirituality, and now we're going to be talking about humor as philosophy. Now we've talked about this idea before. Uh, we talked about the fact that humor and philosophy shared a lot of of uh, tendencies. Uh, humor itself can become philosophical. And that's, again, a postmodern idea. Now, why is that postmodern? Because remember, it is a combining of high and low culture. High culture philosophy, of course, like, wow, you know, that's a that's kind of that highfalutin sort of thinking. And humor, which is 
sometimes pretty lowbrow, but it comes together in a very natural sort of way. So humor is, again, one of these ways that high and low popular culture can be bound together. And the way in which we do it, the way in which humorists do it, is what's called this wisdom of uncertainty. And what you are doing is you're holding back these absolute truths. And absolute truths are usually, you know, spelled with a capital T. These are transcendent, ahistorical, eternal, forever sort of truths. And it's always been this way. And no, <laughs> no, it hasn't. We constantly create new versions of these capital T truths. So humor, in not taking itself seriously the way that postmodernism does, allows us this kind of wisdom of uncertainty. Like, I'm not really sure, but here's what I'm thinking about. The what I'm thinking about part of humor is what is, of course, funny, but underlying it are these sort of important ideas. Again, not important truth, but important ideas that we should, we should keep in mind. So uh, stand-up comedy is probably one of the best venues, the, the, the greatest sort of realm or milieu in which you can sort of work through ideas philosophically, but with a kind of punchline at the same time, because you're still there to make people laugh, right? Stand-up comedy is not a place to do philosophy, strictly speaking, but you can be philosophical about your humor. And there are very similar ideas at work in both humor and philosophy. So here are some of the examples. Here, here's the kind of that cross-pollination we'll say. Okay, both humor and philosophy explore issues in the form of a kind of dialogue, you know, with various characters. These characters can be imaginary, they could be real. And these imaginary characters can, can be these different points of view that sort of, you know, hash out an argument. And so you explore ideas using imaginary characters that have conflicting po points of view. That's one way. You can then turn around and you can question or analyze experience. And that's kind of the Jerry Seinfeld thing, you know, what's up with airline food, right? Question, question and analysis. Um, detachment and impartial reflection is another way in which the, the humorist can not be emotionally attached to, to the material because they are just merely describing it. Uh, in the description, uh, there is a kind of interpretation and evaluation, but it's usually fairly prescriptive. But it's done with such a skewed point of view that that point of view makes you laugh. But as you're laughing, you're thinking, going, yeah, this, this guy's got a point. So we've got use of detachment, impartial reflection, shifts in perspective that allow us to look at something from with an, kind of in a brand new way. Uh, and the ever popular what if, you know, what if we did this? What if we pushed that further? And all of these uh, devices or tools, you might want to call them, they belong to both philosophy and humor in, in a very specific way. And ultimately, all of them, because they're doing the what if, they're questioning, they're analyzing, you know, they're exploring, what are they doing? They're critically challenging authority. Ultimately, that's what they're both doing. Philosophy and humor do the very same thing. So one of the masters, no longer with us, unfortunately, but one of the masters of this kind of observational, philosophical slash anthropological kind of humor, in my mind, is George Carlin. And so he is, is the master of this wisdom of uncertainty. As much as he makes declamatory statements, he does work from that wisdom of uncertainty. Uh, at the very least, he's not quite sure why people do the things they do, but he goes to great lengths to describe them. And therein lies the humor. His humor questions and analyzes experience. In this clip here, now you can watch the whole thing. It's about nine minutes, but the first sort of four and a half minutes in particular, I think are very, very effective in questioning and analyzing experience, specifically our use of language. And he talks about one particular word, shell shock. And watch how he unravels this very simple idea that about, let's say, 100 years ago, the word meant something. And what he does is he, he unpacks this idea, and we are laughing, but we're also questioning and analyzing the very thing that he's talking about in a serious manner. Now, he doesn't present it in a serious manner. He does present it in a, in a humorous way. But behind his words is still a serious intent a philosophical inquiry into language. So have a look at that, and we'll see you back in a moment. 
So philosophical or observational humor, uh, we think it is, is something that's very recent, but it's been around actually for quite some time uh, since really the, the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, in these kind of anthropological sort of views of the everyday life of ourselves, you know, our, us with our foibles and goofy things that we do, um, it's been around since the early 60s. And some of the earliest people doing it were Lenny Bruce. So there's an image of him right here and Mort Saul, both kind of worked around the same time. Uh, and they were sort of on the cusp of postmodernism. Again, depending on who you ask, postmodernism starts at different times. But let's say by the 1960s, it's in full swing. So politically, economically, you know, uh, socially, postmodernism may start slightly different times, give or take, you know, half a decade. But in terms of culture, uh, that's that one is much harder to pin down because quite often uh, it, it, it is the poets and the writers that see things for the first time. So uh, I think last week I mentioned, you know, there was a, a line from uh, Stéphane Mallarmé from the 1880s, right? 1880s. And post-structuralism was not even an idea, let alone a thing until the second world, the end of the Second World War. So let's say the 1950s. So a long time before the words of a poet began to make sense. So I digress. Point is, stand-up comedians that use this postmodern observational type of humor have been around since basically the early 1960s. Now, Lenny Bruce in particular, one of my favorites, uh, he addressed very specific issues relating to society, politics, law and religion and he took the the position not of a holy fool that wishes you know wishes for us to embrace something but the position of a skeptic right that wisdom of uncertainty and he does it very very well but underlying his ideas was this notion of destroying hypocrisy because hypocrisy and we still see it today in fact it's even more blatant uh it's so bad now that hypocrisy is almost rubbed in our face by politicians and those in power who are very well aware they're in power and you know what you can make a joke about me but at the end of the day i'm going to only cry all the way to the bank right they know that so hypocrisy in modern society is very useful and necessary but it really doesn't dismantle the system that allows some of these individuals to you know to address the state of affairs that we're in so hypocrisy is good but it hasn't destroyed modern society. Uh, if it's done anything, it's identified the real problems. So still useful though. Now this clip here from Lenny Bruce on, on of all things, fake news. Now it wasn't fake news in 1959. It was done last year. This was done in 1959. So uh, 62 years ago, this was a clip by Lenny Bruce on fake news. And here you can see that observational kind of humor you know, it's detached, it's anthropological, uh, observations of every day. He's talking about just a newspaper. So he takes one story and he talks about all the different ways in which uh, different newspapers address a, a simple thing and <laughs> how different each one takes, you know, uh, each one has a different take on it. So quite funny, uh, not, you know, belly laughs, you know, knee slapping humor, but observational humor where we look at it and go, yeah, I know what he's talking about. And that's where this kind of humor works really well. So have a look at this and I'll see you back in a moment. Okay, so we've had Lenny Bruce uh, talking in the early 60s, Mort Saul as well. I have a personal, uh, you know, I'm personally favorites of Lenny Bruce more so than Mort Saul. But again, I digress. Uh, but someone that certainly uh, took up the mantle of you know, puncturing hypocrisy is uh, is Bill Hicks. And Bill Hicks was uh, a very popular comedian in the 1980s. Um, you know, this kind of cos comically gosmic religion. Uh, this sort of thing that Bill, uh, Bill Hicks was doing, much like Lenny Bruce, attacked religious intolerance, uh, very self-reflexive self and critical, very aware of what they're saying. They're not just throwing these jokes out. They're aware of the impact that the joke will have on, on individuals. So what Bill Hicks does is he tells us that our critical and skeptical faculties are perhaps the most powerful weapon that we have against the spectacle, right? Against this behemoth of 
social and economic and cultural ideas all sort of wrapped up into one so that every moment that we're not working, you know, we're busy thinking about the next thing to buy, which is what the spectacle does. And now that we have corporate media, you know, every time we turn around or try to get to get some sense of what's going on, going on in the world, um, guess what? That information's controlled, right? And that narrative is controlled by economic interests, et cetera, et cetera. So Hicks, just like Lenny Bruce, believe that the mind was still probably the most powerful weapon that we had. And the more we use it and the less we rely on what other people think, uh, probably the better off we're going to be. So this clip, uh, Bill Hicks, Bill Hicks on religion, not very long, but again, kind of, you can see him at work, how he comes up with various ideas regarding religion and regarding the way in which, uh, people really sometimes don't, uh, understand fully what they are believing in. So take a look at this a couple minutes long and I will see you back in just a moment. A more recent comedian uh, is Russell Brand. Now Russell Brand kind of goes in a different direction. He can be satirical and parodic and so on, but there's something about Russell Brand that uh, I believe aligns him more with someone like Thomas Pynchon. He's unworlding constantly. And what he does is he seems to skewer and satirize religious ideas while kind of uh, while celebrating them at the same time. He he makes fun of the juxtaposition, right? The, this contrast between the secular and the sacred. But he doesn't do it in a way that that uh, is mocking it completely. What he's doing is getting us to think about these spiritual matters. And so what he's doing is, you know, on a kind of metaphysical or cosmic level, he's trying to unite these two ideas, much like Thomas Pynchon is trying to unworld the secular and the sacred and have them interpenetrate together. So what's happening here is Brand's, you know, sort of his ver version of cosmic unity or unworlding, uh, you know, he's satirical, he mocks and so on, but we're not quite sure if the punchline is at the expense of a spiritual matter or the spiritual matter is kind of the final arbiter of the joke. So what's happening is we're, we're, he's talking about spiritual matters, but he does it in a sometimes derogatory mocking sort of satirical way, but not in a way that, that dispenses with it altogether. Now remember satire, satire usually makes fun of something that the writer or speaker considers worthwhile. So when someone is satirizing religion, think carefully about what they're really trying to do. Are they trying us to trying to get us to think about something from a different perspective? Because if they're going to make fun of something, they'll make fun of it. But satire, if it's done well, there's always that underlying belief that what's being satirized is important. It's worth considering. So. Russell Brand's humor is a little bit ambiguous in that way uh, because he is trying to uh, present these two ideas as coexisting, the secular, the, the secular and the sacred. And so we now have to think about the punchline and ask ourselves whether it undercuts those spiritual ideas or kind of reaffirms them. So it's very much about unworlding. It's very much about the way Thomas Pynchon creates these worlds where the 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 secular and the spiritual coexist and really what do, uh, what um, brand is doing is he strips away all that dogma and what dogma is it's orthodoxy you must do this you must follow this or else if you don't follow that you will burn in hell or whatever or of course the up the upside is if you do follow this you're going to go to heaven that's being dogmatic and so what brand is doing is he's asking spirit uh, asking us to consider spiritual matters but kind of as they relate to our everyday life. How can I be a more spiritual person? How can I be connected with something greater than myself? That's not a bad thing because you can think about it in relation to the environment, in relation to what you do here could impact someone in another part of the world. That's still, speak, that's still thinking and, and believing in spiritual matters. If spirit is what glues us all together globally, that's not a bad thing. So Brand is, is using stand-up comedy as this kind of setting in which to talk about matters that have been up until recently 
pushed to the sidelines because religious matters were typically, you know, considered as dogmatic or, uh, um, you know, orthodoxy. Look at the world only this way. And, and if you don't, then you're going to burn in hell. You're, you're heathen, et cetera, et cetera. And brand now sort of softens the, the cell. There's, it's a soft cell here. It's not religion. It's spirituality and spirituality maybe something that is a more approachable to people that are either agnostic or, you know, are not sure what to believe in. So that's what Brand is doing is using stand up comedy to talk about things that can really matter to us in a significant way. Because if we can think, if we can think spiritually, maybe the world isn't so, you know, so bad off after all. Now, the clip I have, and you can find all kinds of Russell Brand bits on YouTube. This is just a very short, it's about a minute and a half even. It's a Netflix special that he had a couple of years ago called Rebirth. And um, <laughs> again, he does the same thing. He, he unworlds by the world by combining the sacred and the, se the secular. But at the same time, he kind of undercuts it by saying, you know, that he's doing this for a reason. So have a look at the clip, not very long, but it's really just a trailer for the Netflix uh, comedy special they had a couple of years ago called Rebirth. Okay, so humorous philosophy, uh, we have a willingness finally, you know, amongst critics to look at stand up comedy as legitimate, you know, as a legit legitimate area of study because there are legitimate serious concerns that are being discussed. Now, let's say over the last four years, uh, late night comedians have had a field day with the buffoonery that is the, or that was the Trump administration. I'm so pleased to be saying the word was. Um, now some people, and I've got a couple of friends that I used to work with, hate that. Hate the fact that comedians talk about politics. Okay. I, I, I respect that. That's the way they, you know, they, they don't think that comedians should be talking about political matters. They're just there to make us laugh. But I think Things were so serious that comedians took it upon themselves, especially the late night ones, to, again, satirize the presidency, the administration, politics, American culture, because they wanted to save it, because there was something worth saving. This guy is going to run roughshod over everything. A friend of mine was really pleased that Trump got elected because he's, he said, look, you know, he's great because he's going to be a wrecking ball. Oh, he was a wrecking ball. All right. But at what point do you throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? And destroy everything. At which point, where do you start? So as you can imagine, we had some disagreements, respectfully, of course, because he's a friend of mine. But what's happening with these comedians is as they satirize the presidency and Trump and so on, they're also uh, presenting ideas, you know, because they have the artistic freedom as stand-up comedians to kind of express truths um, that can be difficult, but because they're in a comedic set a setting, people can laugh about them, but think about them at the same time. So that stand up, you know, stand up comedy club or uh, late night, you know, talk shows, that monologue at the beginning is, is a kind of arena. It's a venue or a milieu where these kinds of ideas can be discussed, serious ideas, but they're done in a way that still generates comedy and laughter. But these are, you know, truths about the world that are presented using artistic freedom. So what happens is there's a little bit of stretching of the truth, just enough so people can still recognize what's going on. But what they're doing is they're questioning the social world that we live in and the value system that informs it. Again, satire doesn't dismiss its subject outright. If you're just making fun of something, you're making fun of it. But if you're satirizing it, underlying that condition or that that rhetorical device is this belief that that subject is worth saving, that object that you're making fun of, ridiculing is worth saving because you're you're pissed off for some reason that of what's going on. So you're going to make fun of it in the same way that you wish other people to think about it as they're laughing to think about it seriously. So there's that weird combination again, which is very postmodern. So, uh, you know, we don't know what is fact or fiction in comedy, especially in stand up. And that's part of its appeal. That's part of its power. And so comedians can stretch the truth. We already know that is, that is uh, the case because, you know, at the end, they can always say, I was only joking. 
right? When uh, when politicians become really upset over uh, comedians, comedians can just go, "I was only joking. They're just words, right?" I didn't. I I'm sorry, but I, unlike you, Mr. Trump, did not advocate for the overthrow of the American government. I'm just pissed off at your behavior. End of discussion. I was only joking. So, philosophical ideas, spiritual ideas, can become entertaining, accessible, worth considering, and even sometimes subversive. Right? Think of the holy fool. Right? Subverting our 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 desire for material world, wealth, um, and they're they're doing it without the kind of dogmatic orthodoxy that religion would would sort of force upon it. So remember, these are spiritual matters, not necessarily religious matters. Religion has a dogmatic element. Spirituality seems to be much more flexible. It's about you know it's self awareness that we are not alone in the world. That our actions matter. Our thoughts matter. Our, our words matter. They will a- affect and influence other people. And that therein lies, you know, the importance of spirituality. Now, uh, the fact that we don't know whether, you know, what a standard comedian is, is telling us the truth or it's fiction, that can work sort of in, in part of the, the power of the joke. Uh, this is another bit by George Carlin just talking about stuff. Just stuff. Now, does he really believe this? Does he really have a problem with his stuff? It doesn't matter. What matters is him talking about stuff. So comedians, George Carlin or otherwise, have this arena in which they can engage with, you know, what we consider to be normal, but under the lens of comedy, somehow starts to look kind of rather irrational. So have a look at George Carlin talking about stuff, and I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so the last part here I want to talk about, and this is, again, very much part of uh, postmodernism, uh, which is uh, postmodern, uh, postmodern feminism, uh, feminist writers, feminist critics. Uh, remember what I said at the very beginning, both beginning of this, this set of slides and last week, is postmodernism is all about questioning authority. And the biggest authority that we have right now, whether we you know, wish to acknowledge it or not, is patriarchy. Right, patriarchal thinking, um, a world run by men. That's what patriarchy is. So, if laughter can be potentially subversive, and there is the ability to destabilize and and usurp and undercut systems, authority systems such as patriarchy, then feminism has the the potential to use humor to undercut this very powerful entity called patriarchy, as it influences our language system, our social systems, definitely our economic systems, and very often our political systems. So patriarchy is this this behemoth, this this overarching view of the world, and in particular the view of women, and feminists have used humor to push back, right? To push back, and we become very aware of how the simplest things like even our language you know our our ourselves as social beings are really part of this overriding view of the world that is patriarchal that now that of course is changing and has been changing for again depends how far back you want to go uh feminism and feminist thought is really kind of begins in the 1800s here and there uh really kind of comes into its own in the 19th century and it goes full out during the 20th century and we've now we're believe in the fourth wave of feminist thought this is part of the kind of the third wave the tail end of the third wave um these are ideas again uh using laughter to to push back and undercut patriarchy because it is a very powerful entity so what is patriarchy? It's this right here. Unequal pay, uh, you know, uh, female abuse, wife abuse, um, the gender roles where women have been sort of fixed into only a certain kind of uh, social role that has been the same for thousands of years and only now just changing. Objectification of women. Uh, unrealistic standards of beauty, which goes ties together with objectification, the rape culture that we live in, that somehow it is women who need to change, right? not men. Like just, just stop thinking about raping uh, women. That's the rape culture. The focus is on women to change, not men. Uh, male-dominated industries, uh, gender stereotypes, shaming language, all these things 
all part of patriarchy. And it is a very pervasive and influenced worldview that often most of us haven't really realized existed until we become self-aware, you know, of our position in the world or uh, as white males are a tremendous position of, of privilege. So these are things that we need to be aware of uh, before, you know, we turn around and start pontificating about other people. We need to be aware of who we really are as white men. So one of the most important things about the way in which patriarchy can work is how it, it seeps into language. And language and our social and cultural identities are the three ways in which patriarchy can work very kind of, excuse me, seamlessly and behind, you know, behind the scenes to inform the way that we see the world. And if you can control language, you are controlling the way people think. Because think about it, we cannot walk around with a wheelbarrow full of stuff. And every time I want to say the word brick or dog or whatever, I have to lift it up and go, here, here you go. No, we use a language to describe things. And we use language to access our own consciousness, right? The way we think about the world is done in and through language. And if language itself is influenced and it is a pervasive part of patriarchy, um, that's where you can attack it. Because language, right, is who we are how we name the world. There cannot be anything more important than that. The fact that we use language to literally define who we are and the world around us. So until we see it pointed out, we don't realize that language has got inherent prejudices um, and that language reflects and perpetuates these prejudices that are primarily patriarchal. So it sounds very heavy duty and you can go down the rabbit hole that it is very uh, important, but what you think about is is using language and the hope is that you don't think about it in any significant way because language you know it's structured in a certain way it uses reason and logic we agree to words because ultimately at the end of the day the words that we use are agreed to and certain words sort of fade in and out of popularity uh the meaning of certain words will fade in and out so Language is alive, right? It's constantly alive and constantly morphing and remorphing into different things, but it still uses structure, reason, and logic. Well, what does humor do, right? It goes after all of those things. It turns all of those things on its head. Humor can be absurd, irrational, experimental. It rejects structures of all kinds. And if it can do that, humor becomes that ideal tool that uses language to attack the very system that it itself uses language to hide behind. So you use language and words to unmask what's going on, where you unmask this patriarchal structure that allows people to think and say words without really realizing what they're doing. Here's a quick example. Uh, I don't know how many of you speak French or took French, but this is the one that stuck in my mind. Um, and this is my, my female French teacher great person, loved her. She says, here, here's what's going on. In the French language, there's il and elle, right? Il, he, elle, her. There could be a thousand women in a room and you would use elle, the plural, E-L-L-E-S. The moment a single man steps in, into that room, the plural changes to il, I-L-S. Very simple. There it is. Nobody asks any questions. Uh, a man walked in, it's il, it's still plural. And every woman in that room going, uh, hell no, <laughs> what about me? I've just been, you know, subsumed. I've just been, I've just disappeared under this word il. So quick example. But um, this is where when people point it out to you, you start to think, well, why is that? Well, because patriarchy has had a hand in creating and structuring language for a very long time. It likes to hide behind words that seem innocuous and safe and uh, kind of almost non unimportant. But humor, what does it do? It goes after those things, right? That observational humor, that anthropological point of view, like, hey, what if, what if this? Um, Ahmad Jamal, right? Talking about reverse racism. It's funny, but you stop and think like, holy cow. Yeah, what he's just described is exactly what we have done from Western Europe and have destroyed all these colonized countries. We're laughing, but we're going, wow, okay, 
I get it. I see what he means. So uh, before we go any further, I just want to uh, give you a quick sort of top 10 female comedians because I want to tell you or uh, indicate to you that uh, female comedians have been around for a very long time, since basically the 1950s. Again, what also started around the 1950s? Oh my God, postmodernism. There you go. So female comedians have come into their own over the last 50 or 60 years. But I just want you to have a look at the top 10 female comedians, both new and old, to give you a sense that these are this is not something brand new. They've been around for about half a century and have done important and groundbreaking work. Um, so have a look at that and then I'll see you back in just a moment. Okay, so the laugh of the Medusa. This is a one particular idea that I want to look at uh, from, again, a French, right, uh, French feminist uh, writer, uh, Hélène Sixou. And she wrote a paper uh, called The Laugh of the Medusa, where she started to dismantle that patriarchal structure, right, of, of language. And what she does is she breaks apart that binary logic, right, that, that language loves to have. And that is the kind of the structure of the signifier and the signified. Uh, signifier is a word. What does it signify? So tree uh, signifies, you know, a tall thing that grows maybe in your front lawn or in a park. It looks a certain way. It's usually green, you know, kind of sort of loses its leaves in the fall, etc. So there is the relationship between words and what they mean. Pretty simple. But what, what Elensi Su does is she looks at it from a feminist perspective, right? Just like comedy has that unique what if perspective, right? The mental flexibility. And what she does, she focuses on what's called uh, feminine writing. And feminine writing uses both humor and laughter very strategically. It can satirize, it can mimic, it, it paradises, it's very parodic. Uh, Hélène Sixou, uh, Luce Irigaray is another French writer. And what she, what both of them do, and others as well, they use the structure of philosophy as it has existed over the last, you know, few hundred years. Now you can go back a couple of millennia as well. But what they do is they, they do a kind of parodic reading of the, uh, the particular philosophers that they like and will either uh, engage in a conversation with them using the structure of a, let's say, a platonic dialogue. And a platonic dialogue, I mean, Plato was writing these things 2,500 years ago, but they use the platonic dialogue form to engage with the thinker, the philosopher, and ask him questions. Because Plato would simply have a dialogue to prove his own point. So along come these, these feminist writers, they use the same structure, right? They satirize it. They may, they, they do a parody of it. So it's not like it's laugh out loud, but you can recognize what they're doing. So what they're doing is they're subverting and undercutting a structure of presentation, which has worked in the past because no one's questioned it. Everyone knew what Plato was doing. You know, he's having different characters all kind of allegedly, you know, disagree with one another, but Plato really is using it so that eventually, all those different disagreements all eventually agree on one thing. And there's the main point. So what Sixou, Irigaray, and others do is they use that, that same form in a very parodic kind of way. And they undercut the ability of the philosopher to come to a conclusion, come to agreement about something. So that's the kind of feminist writing that we're talking about. And it is uses humor and laughter very strategically to undercut the ability of that voice to be authoritative, to engage in a meta narrative, to have the final say. And these feminists say, no, no, you don't get the final word, right? We're going to leave this open. So feminist writing uh, deals with a female body, with sexuality, but it use, it does it in a humorous and, and you know, sort of laughter filled kind of way that is very strategic. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the story of Medusa, now pay attention to it because it is a very interesting but very violent story. So the story of Medusa, Greek mythology, have a look at that before we come back to the laughter of the Medusa and we look at it in a bit more detail. So see you back in a moment. Okay, so uh, Sixou's essay uh, is a kind of parodic rereading of an essay written by Freud, right, our our friend Sigmund Freud, we ran into him when we were talking about relief theory a short time ago. He wrote an essay in 1922 called Medusa's Head. 
And Freud uh, used the idea of Medusa uh, as a symbol of horror, right? Medusa's head, and he traces it back to female genitalia. This idea that the, that open mouth, right, devoid of a penis, castrated, and the sight of female uh, genitalia, for for Freud, he said, okay, well, when a man catches sight of female genitalia, he symbolically turns to stone. Well, symbolically, yes, but it also maybe leads to an erection, uh, which is really kind of what Freud is saying. But he weaves this weird tale of um, sexual arousal, right? That's really what he's talking about. But he somehow weaves it into this, this myth of Medusa. In other words, uses Medusa uh, as simply a vehicle, right, a, a signpost to talk about uh, male excitation at female genitalia. But it is at the expense of Medusa. And Sixou goes back and revisits that essay and went, goes, hell no, <laughs> no, here's what I'm going to do. So she literally turns around and laughs at this idea that he presents. So uh, Freud's sort of description is full of this phallocentric symbolism. And what that means is, it very clearly, uh, it's about having and not having. For Freud, it's always about having, right? Having a penis, which makes it phallocentric. And anything that is lacking something is somehow deficient. It's absent of something. So right there, there is a comparison for Freud, with Freud between, you know, plenitude and absence. Something is there, something is not there. But if something is not there, somehow it's it's devalued. So for Freud, female genitalia symbolizes the absence of something. Well, of course, because it isn't a penis. It isn't, it's not apples and oranges here, is it? It's one thing is and the other is not. Therefore, it is lacking in some way. So the female signifies somehow an absence of something that the male signifies as being present. Now, I know it's not a psycho, a psycho a psychology class, psychoanalytic is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we don't want to get into psych, psychoanalytic theory too much, but this is kind of the general premise of what Freud is doing. He's applying the notion of presence as good and absence as bad. And what uh, Sixou does is laughs at it, just literally laughs at the whole idea. So what she does is she subverts that patriarchal nature of myth. Now, when you listen to the story, like this boy, you've already watched the clip, uh, of rape and betrayal, I mean, just horrible things that happen to Medusa. She's otherwise a decent person. But Sixou brings that part of the story back in, right? She subverts this very uh, cherry-picked and narrow re -re oh, well, reading of the Medusa myth and expands it, opens it up, and brings back these other stories. Because Medusa is betrayed, right, through no fault of her own. So Sixou undercuts Freud's idea by saying, yeah, you forgot this, right, <laughs> kind of important. So she does that. She exposes mythology as this masculine construct, you know, written by men, for men. And mythology, for the most part, is if you know anything about Greek mythology, is the constant under, uh, undercutting of women. Um, it's a perennial idea that that women are uh, devious and subversive and, you know, always trying to have one over on men. And so, yeah, mythology was written by men and for men, essentially. Uh, Sixu also tries to create the possibility that the story can change its meaning. Um, you know, Athene, Athena was also jealous of Medusa. Where do you put that? Uh, well, Freud never talked about it. And so this is something very serious with Freud. When we look at the original story, whether it's the Oedipus complex, the Medusa complex, these are psychoanalytic theories that he presents. But he so narrowly and cherry picks the story to just have that little part of it that is going to reflect his specific idea that he really denigrates the full you know, the full story of Medusa or Oedipus, whoever it is. So what Sixou is doing is she subverts the myth. She exposes mythology as masculine, creates a possibility that the story can now change because now we deal with other things that are not included in the typical retelling that we see in psychoanalysis. And finally, rejects the whole idea of, of the feminine genitalia as somehow an absence of something. And she says, women must write herself, right? Not herself, 
herself, right, with a paw, with the with the space in between. So she completely turns all of that upside down. So and she does it in a very humorous kind of way. So laughter becomes part of a language that will free women from this narrative that women turn around and can laugh at the ridiculous premises that that patriarchy uh, presents to women. And so that female body is allowed to express itself. Uh, laughter is aligned with pleasure. Now, remember that. Who said that, right? Plato. Plato said that, right? Laughter is bad because it aligns itself with base instincts. You know, it's uh, it's something that should we should always not worry about pleasure. We should always you know, be looking upwards to the skies and thinking reasonably. Um, no, no pleasure is a bodily is a bodily function. Laughter is a bodily pleasure. We need to bring that back. And one of the interesting things with the French language that you may or may not know is the word jouissance, for example. It's a French word that means both pleasure, um, to, to, to jouir, for example, to be pleased. But jouissance is also orgasm. So those two words are in, they interpenetrate one another. So jouissance can mean both of those things. So jouissance and laughter and pleasure and those three things all mingle together in this kind of feminist writing or feminine writing that Hélène Sixou presents to us. So the feminine writing, uh, writing that the, that is used by women, uh, is can be done using parody and humor. It mocks that status quo, which is otherwise very important because it has to do with patriarchy. Uh, and ultimately, and I mentioned this before, the worst thing that an authority figure can get is people laughing at them. Well, big surprise. Here it works the same way. Laughter becomes a sound of defiance, the sound of pushback, the sound of people people saying, hell no, this is not what we're going to take. So laughter here, finally, it's sort of at the heart of these female narratives that liberate and push away all the bullshit of thousands of years that women have had to put up with, uh, you know, male forms of reason and logic. And they're saying, no. We're not going to go for this. We're not going to go for the kind of logic and reason that you have used to hold us down. So that's why postmodernism, as much as Terry Eagleton is, I'm not saying Terry Eagleton hates women, but Terry Eagleton is talking about enlightenment, you know, has done a lot. Well, it has, yes, but the same kind of reason and logic that informs uh, uh, patriarchal thinking is what's going on here. So that becomes very, very important. We need to break that down. So, uh, Liza Schlesinger, uh, one of my favorite new comedians, and I'm just going to pause here for a moment. Just took a little break there. My my wife and our grandson just came in, so I just wanted to pause for just a sec. So to wrap up, last slide. Uh, this is a clip. Uh, Liza Schlesinger, uh, one of the new uh, female comedians that have uh, come over the last sort of six or eight years. Um, to me, a really good example of that kind of... Uh, turning on its head the typical ideas that we have about uh, relationships between men and women. Uh, it's called eating around men. And here we can, we can hear the parodic humor making fun of a situation that all of us can recognize. Um, and the laughter that she instills is that laughter of defiance because it is not only that, it's, she's not only laughing at a situation that uh, we men may not have been aware of before, but she talks about it from her point of view. And that's where you kind of subvert the narrative that we've heard for many, many years, you know, the point of view of the, of the male. Now we get to hear from the from the woman's point of view. And not only that, when, it, when we talk about uh, feminine writing coming from the body, uh, pay particular attention to all the weird sounds that she makes, uh, the, the sounds of, you know, grunting and animal sounds and so on. Uh, of course, you're wondering, like, what is she doing? But trust me, when you see the clip, but it's, a, it's called Eating Around Men, uh, very funny, and her work is really a good example of, of this parodic uh, turning on its head of typical situations that we all find ourselves in, but we hear about it now from this kind of liberating feminist perspective. So have a look at that. It's the last uh, slide. So uh, that's it. We're done. And I will see you back on Monday where we're going to unpack this a little bit more. So take care and we'll see you soon.